Great, thank you, Dingyu, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is joint work um, in preparation with uh, Sasha, um, Rahul, and uh, Ran from ETH. And um, it's, I've given a couple of talks about this. It's kind of hard to say uh, something meaningful in an hour. So I, I think the strategy will be that I'll spend like the first part of the talk giving kind of an informal overview very briefly of the type of things that we have, type of results we have. And then um, this, I'll kind of, this will allow me to kind of uh, clear the slate in the second part and start again slowly and give definitions and um, hopefully even prove some things and give you intuition to what's going on. Um, so if, I guess what I'm trying to say is if you lose me in the beginning, um, don't despair, ask questions and uh, maybe give me a second sh shot at, after the, uh, uh, at the second part. Okay, so a little bit of notation before we start. Let me know if you can't see something or, okay. So XL will denote throughout the talk CP1, RP1. Um, and we'll think of CP1 as being equipped with an S1 action. So this is X, this is L. Um, there's an S1 acting on uh, CP1 by rotating it, and it has two fixed points, which will denote P plus and P minus. And a moduli specification is informally the discrete data moduli specification S is the discrete data associated with a map or a marked map from a Riemann surface, possibly disconnected and with boundary, um, to the pair XL. So the boundary of the Riemann surface is map maps to L, uh, together with some marked points on the interior. So. Uh, okay. So just a few, yeah, so sigma is a smooth Riemann surface, possibly disconnected with boundary, as I've said. Um, it will be convenient to assume that the labeling set is some finite subset of n. You'll see why in a minute. And right. OK, so more explicitly, what is this s? What is, what is the data in s? Well, first of all, there's the number of connected component of the Riemann surface. And then we have a tuple of, of data for each, um, one for each uh, connected component. First, we have the subset of markings. So those j, such as zj, is on the ith component. So let's write sigma as a disjoint union of sigma 1, dot, 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 sigma n. So these are the markings on the ith component. We have the degree of the, um, of the map restricted to sigma i. So that's an element of H2 XL, which is just, um, it turns out that these integers are non-negative for holomorphic maps. We have the genus, which by definition is just 1 minus the order characteristic of, I, of the ith piece. We have the number of boundary components of the ith component. Um, and then we have the boundary degrees. So uh, it's a little, can you see what I, sorry, bad uh, planning. All right, so each di alpha is some element in um, the first homology of L and specifies the degree of the boundary component, the ith, the alpha th boundary component. OK, good. Um, all right. So given this, this data, 
we can consider the compactified moduli space will denote by this uh, m bar s, the compactified moduli space of mats. Stable maps fitting that description. And our goal, which is still, I guess this is the part where it gets a little bit informal. And oh. will be to compute um, or to say something about the open gram of written invariant associated with the S, which by definition will be the integral over MS bar of product over all J and L, psi J, AJ. So I need to say a few words about this. So first of all, um, yeah, so AJ are some non-negative integers. And epsilon j is some uh, value, either plus or minus 1. And so now you see why I like to work with these uh, finite subsets L. It's just a way of saying that the integrand is encoded by S also, by the subset L. So we've fixed these in advance. Um, OK, now what are these psi's? So psi j is the first churn class of the, um, of the ith uh, sorry, the, the first term class of the jth uh, cotangent line, right? So Lj is the cotangent to the domain at the jth mark point. And rho plus minus 1 is Poincaré dual, Poincaré dual to either p plus or minus 1, okay, to one of these uh, fixed points. So as you can guess, I'm thinking equivalently, but for now you can just think about the classical limit. So you can just assume that um, I'll explain in what sense you can e equivalently extend this in a minute. But it's also interesting, perfectly interesting, to ask the question of what these integrals are um, when you think uh, in classical terms. Um, all right, so this is still not quite well defined, right? Um, so let me kind of say where, what, where things stand now. So first of all, we say that S is rational. Say S is rational if all the connected components are either disks or spheres. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I assume that I fixed some, once and for all, you know, before I even know what S is, I fixed some sequence of non-negative integers, AJ, and some sequence of plus minus ones, bits, some sequence of bits, epsilon J. Okay. And I choose them in a way such that every value is obtained infinitely many times, right? And so that way I can encode any integral that I want just by specifying a finite subset L of N. Okay, don't worry about this too much. It's just a technicality. Yeah. Sure. Why do these why are these different? No, no, no. D I plus and D I minus. Oh yeah, sure. So what is the second homology? Think about think about it as, as the, the homology of the quotient space of X by the uh, equator. So that's essentially a pair of spheres. Right? What's the quotient space? It looks like this, right? When you when you kind of turn this into a point, you get two spheres. So you can think about the, each copy of Z as measuring the number of times you cover each one of these spheres. Or in a more pedestrian way, it's just the number of times you cover each hemisphere in your, each time your map covers each. What is like an example of a map that you, like what's so the simplest map where DI plus is different than DI minus? So just take this uh, hemisphere. 
right? That's a map from a disk. It covers just the upper half, so the degree is 1, 0. OK, that's a map from a Riemann surface with boundary to x, com okay, comma, l. Yeah, I drew the target, and now I've also drawn the domain of the map. In this case, it's just a disk. Okay, so I can have like two disks, and one of them maps like double to the top, and sure. then one maps degree one to the bottom. And that's, like that's another good yeah. example. Sorry. Great, no problem. Okay, so um, all right, so we say S is rational if all the connected components are disks of spheres. Great, um, and in this case, the moduli space M S is an orbifold with corners with an S1 action. Um, if you don't know what orbifold with corners are, you can just think manifold with corners. Um, the, the point here is that we know that CP1 is convex. So maps from genus 0 domains to CP1 are unobstructed. And we can look at the moduli space, kind of the algebraic geometric moduli space of of curves, and then we can do some simple manipulations to get to MS, right? So by simple manipulations, I mean look at the fixed points under some involution that comes from conjugation, and then blow up some codimension one loci and take some, and then choose a fundamental domain. So um, you can read uh, the details of this in, in some preprint that I put online, but um, I think this is kind of uh, easy to believe result. Um, And, and sorry, I, I wanted to add that you know, the upshot of all this is that you can do differential geometry. right? That's the model you should remember. You can do differential geometry in a kind of very um, low-tech way. Um, in particular, you can define this integral right, as just a usual integral of forms on a manifold with corners or orbifold with corners. Um, that still doesn't mean this is well defined, right? So maybe um, I want to emphasize that because the boundary um, is not empty, even in this uh, rational case, we need we need uh, we need boundary conditions. But what we will see is that there is a natural way to kind of define boundary conditions, and then. Um, Star is well defined, independent of all choices. Um, and there's a fixed point formula that computes it explicitly. Um, and maybe. It's important to emphasize that it involves contributions from all the corners of the moduli space. We'll see um, uh, with contributions, so I'll write this briefly as contributions from all the corners of the moduli space. Good. What else do we know? Um, so the third situation, which is also, uh, well, by now it's quite easy. Suppose the modular specification is closed, so there are no boundary components, and there are no boundary components. Um, in this case, we know that the moduli spaces are, um, you know, so we can use just the algebraic geometric definition of MS, and we know it carries a, a perfect obstruction theory. And everything is well defined. And in particular, we can compute um, star by virtual localization. So that's uh, kind of been established uh, over a decade ago. Um, so the final case, which is kind of the most interesting, is S is not rational um, and has uh, you know, some hi not equal to 0, so it has some boundary. And in this case, um, you know, this is kind of notoriously difficult, right? We need to use some, some sort of uh, uh, virtual techniques, um, which is 
which we haven't done. What we have done is we kind of conjectured, um, we conjecture a tractable, so an explicitly computable formula for star. And oh, I should say it, extending, it of course extends what we know, the cases we know, which is two and three. Um, but there's more evidence, and I want to spend the rest of the kind of the, this first part of the talk just by kind of outlining the evidence for this formula in, in part four. So the first part of the evidence is a bunch of relations that are kind of geometrically very plausible, but algebraically non-trivial. And they, um, I'll give an example of one of them, or, or central one, which is the map decomposition property. Let me kind of tell you the geometric motivation for it. So the idea is, if you look at a map to, um, you know, look at, look at some map from some domain to XL, and let's assume that this map is unramified over, um, over RP1 and use that to decompose our domain or to cut it up along the inverse image of F inverse 1. So here's an example. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so here's my domain sigma. In this case, I, I'll assume it has no boundary and that the map is unramified over RP1. Then we look at the inverse image and we can cut it up into, in this case, three regions, right? Two regions. What? What do you mean by I mean the derivative of f does not vanish over any over any point in the inverse image of RP1. But is that in the sigma that means that it's even non-invariant? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. In, it, it, the inverse image okay, can so like each one of these inverse images. So each component is really non-invariant. The, the no, I mean these these will have actually we call these the perimeters. Actually, the degrees. So each loop here will have some disjoint union of loops. Each loop L. Um, I was just about to say, we'll have some, some degree which we call the perimeter, PL. Um, and each region, region is you know, one of these uh, domains that are cut up by these loops, maps to, um, you know, maps to one of the hemispheres. And in particular, it has some uh, moduli specification associated with it. OK, so I haven't drawn the interior markings, but you can imagine that you, know, you have some sort of discrete data that specifies the isotopy type of the map, but then, um, all right, so, okay, maybe I'll say what, what, what the kind of formula that I'm shooting for is, and that will kind of clarify things. Um, so, you know, the yoga is a map of this type is determined by its restrictions to all the regions, plus gluing data, right? So this leads you to kind of uh, conjecture, a kind of formula that says that the open gram of, sorry, here I meant to write S. So you should think of S as like the, the total specification of the entire map. We expect that to be equal to the invariance associated with each one of the regions. times the choice of the gluing data, which in this case, it's not hard to see that to glue a map, you need to specify kind of you have a choice of um, PL for each, each loop. In fact, there's a minus here for orientation reasons, which you shouldn't worry about too much. And then there's a combinatorial factor, which is just the number of regions factorial, uh, the number of loops factorial. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, well, well one thing I, f I forgot to mention is that you need to sum, of course, over all the types of maps. You should think of a map as specifying some, some uh, chamber inside the moduli space, right? And we have here a sum over all um, isotopy types of maps. Isotopy types of maps. Yeah, so it's some sort of, uh, some sort of decomposition formula. Um, and so this is pretty geometrically plausible, but if you look at the formula, it involves some non-trivial 
um, cancellations. Um, just very briefly, like where do these cancellations come from? So, I mean, if you try to glue the fixed points, you can glue the fixed points uh, pretty easily. But as I've said, the fixed point formula involves also contributions from the boundary and corners of the moduli spaces. So maybe I'll just draw some suggestive drawing. So if we start from this original um, guy, um, it, has, it, has a, it has a boundary which looks like this, right? For example, when the two, um, when these two circles collide, um, and this boundary contributes to the to the to kind of the to the fixed point formula um, of this guy, um, and then it turns out that it cancels with. Okay, it's kind of a, maybe unpleasant for those watching the video. Okay, maybe I'll draw it here. Um, it kind of cancels with this type of boundary. Okay, so this is a boundary forming on, on this, uh, this moduli space. Um, and again, this is all geometrically very plausible. We're just saying that basically, you know, if we look at the chambers of the moduli space, if this is the chamber corresponding to this map, and this is the chamber corresponding to that map, then we get some boundary contributions, but these boundary contributions really cancel in pairs, right? Because the total moduli space uh, of maps from a closed domain doesn't have any boundary. That's basically the statement here. I'm yeah. sorry, I don't know if it's about asking questions, but um, I no, go ahead. confusing this with, uh, I thought S was the combinatorial data. Yeah. So what is, I mean, S is rational. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, sometimes in algebraic geometry, people say rational for genus zero maps, right? Yeah. Like map whose domain is a, is a CP1. So more generally, I say that S is rational if the domain is just a disjoint union of spheres or disks. Uh, so so the topology is particularly simple. Any map with this combinatorial data has a property like No, no, no. This is like, um, OK, this, this, this summary, you should read it as cases. Case one, where we can say something intelligent about S, about OGW of S, is when we assume that S is rational. So S is a disjoint union of spheres and disks. Case two, where we can say something. Okay. Well, okay, that's two is kind of a, sorry. Two, two questions no, go ahead. S isn't a curve, right? S is this combinatorial data. Yeah, right. But uh, okay, so if you want very explicitly, what it means is that the um, Euler characteristic of each component of the domain yes, yes. is either uh, okay. one, curve. and that right, and then has H i zero that corresponds to a disk or um, it's a sphere, in which case the Euler characteristic is two, right? And H I. Yeah. So I'm yeah. the summary then. H I is zero. If I'm trying to compute OGW of S, first I check if S is rational. If it is, then I do that. Yeah. And then I check if the boundary is non-empty. Well, no, well, so sort of one and two are kind of they're remarks. They're not really cases. I, I sorry about that. One and two are kind of go together. They say even if S is rational then we still need to say something about the integrand. We have explained what the domain of integration is, okay. but the integrand still requires some specification to be okay. well-defined. But you're talking to me about part four. If there's nothing good about the problem, then I try your confession. Actually, most of my talk will be about like two, oh. uh, I think. But I hope we'll get to say something about three and four, uh, or mostly four. Yeah. OK. Um, all right, just to finish the list of evidence. So this was the first type of evidence, this, the kind of surprising uh, algebraically surprising, geometrically maybe not so surprising relations. Um, second part of, a, uh, of the evidence for the conjecture is that the conjecture implies that if the degree of pi of s is less than the dimension of m of s, or the expected dimension if you wish, some people like to write virtual dimension, then, um, all right, conjecture implies, maybe I'll write it as um, then we expect OGW to vanish. So again, this is not too surprising geometrically, but because the fixed points have much lower dimension, this actually turns out to be a non-trivial relation on the contributions of all the fixed points. And you can check that, and we check that in some cases. At any rate, um, the point is, I guess, um, that you can get an infinite <laughs> amount of falsifiable claims from this conjecture. And you can 
uh, as much patience and computing power you have, you can use to, to kind of. Right? And the final uh, part of the evidence is that we define open Horvitz numbers We show that they uh, 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 they satisfy kind of an analogous map decomposition property. This is actually a f uh, analogous map decomposition property. And we check that, you know, if you look at uh, maps from disk to a disk, then they agree. So the Grom of Witten, I need to explain in what sense they agree. I don't really have time to do that. Um, I've said some things about that in the 15 minute talk, but um, there is some sort of correspondence between the Grom of Witten invariance and the Horvitz numbers. And we've, we checked that this works for maps from a disk to a disk. Um, just by, you know, so it turns out that this has an explicit formula on both sides, so you can just check it explicitly. And then um, what you find is that using the conjecture, um, or more precisely the, van the relations in part B, you find that um, um, you actually have this kind of Grom of Witten Horvitz correspondence for any topology. To a disk. Um, all right. And this also uses the closed case of the open Grom of Witten, uh, sorry, the closed case of the Grom of Witten Horvitz correspondence, which was uh, proven by Okunkov and uh, Pandhari Pande. So, all right. Um, I hope this wasn't too bad. This concludes the like first part of the talk. And now I'm going to uh, kind of start over, unless you have any questions about this, and sort of uh, try to define more slowly what exactly I mean by this stuff and then prove a fixed point formula between the zero and we'll see. Okay, good. Um, actually, let's not. Yeah. Right, so first of all, I want to emphasize that equivariantly you can have not interesting invariance even when the, it's overdetermined. Um, but you're right that somehow um, you always expect that to vanish. What I said was that it's, it's a non-trivial statement um, when you look at the fixed point formula because the fixed point actually involves integrals on lower, lower dimensional spaces. Because so what? Version, yeah, it's some sort of equivariant version um, that tells you that somehow these. Um, these sums of contributions from the fixed points is equal to zero. And you're right, geometrically it's very plausible, but un until you prove that the fixed point formula actually comes from geometry, um, this is basically, um, you can treat it as evidence, right? You can just check these relations, and if they hold, that suggests that you really have some way of filling in the fixed points to a geometric moduli space or to some sort of well-defined um, singular chain, maybe, I should say, uh, that connects all these guys. All right. Um, yeah. This conjecture is pretty connected with in the most general case. Like yeah, there's a formula for open Grom of Witten of S. And there's like no. Um, this is not the conjecture, right? This is just a, a property of it. But uh, these integrals, instead of actually defining what MS is, we just write a formula for them. No, I understand. But you have no constraints? Like, you don't have to fix the genus or. No. There's, wow. It works in. Uh, you have you the the integrals that appear involve ho Hodge integrals over the closed moduli spaces. Um, maybe I will emphasize that this is, does work in the stationary case. So I've written this sort of in the integral, but I assume that each um, descendant is is uh, carries also a point constraint with it. We have some work in prog in like future work. We have some ideas of what to do in the non-stationary sector. But maybe that's some sort of constraint that we have to place at this point. Okay, but like, if your conjecture is true, then that totally solves open theory perturbed theory. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm the, the, the statement about the non-stationary uh, sector. 
Um, okay, so uh, all right. That's a good question. I mean, I don't, not, I don't know at this point. Um, we really use the the equivariant theory. Um, um, it's the open analog of one of them, I would say, the one that deals with P one. Yeah. Okay. So, open fixed point localization. So, let's say that M is a compact oriented manifold with corners. And everything I say will be true for orbifolds, but I just wanted to keep it simple. And let's say that psi is a vector field um, on M, generating an S1 action. So it's time one integral is um, the identity. And in this case, we can look at the following DGA. I'll denote it by A subscript S1 of M. We'll look at the S1 invariant forms on M with values in the Laurent, uh, in the Laurent uh, uh, polynomial uh, field ring, sorry. Um, with a degree of views 2. Um, and this is equipped with kind of a deformation of the usual exterior derivative, where we um, twi or modify it by contraction with the vector field psi multiplied by u. So you can check this is still degree 1. Um, and the product is the usual wedge product of forms, just with values in this ring, in this commutative ring. And the grading is, of course, the usual Durham grading plus the grading of the, of the ring that we're working over. Um, and this is kind of a model, a well-known model for the localization of the cohomology of the homotopy quotient of M by the S1 action. But you don't need to know what that means to work with this thing. You can define Euler forms and push forward and pull back operations. And, most of the stuff you know from, from differential geometry just carries over. And the, really, the model you should think of is everything is um, kind of a deformation of the classical story with this variable u added everywhere. Um, so one simple example that we'll need is that there's an integration map that goes from um, um, this algebra. Instead of taking values in R, it takes values in this Laurent ring. And it's such a usual integration, right? So you just uh, take the top form part of the and, and integrate it against uh, M and extend, extend, U linea, uh, extend scalars. OK. Um, a standing assumption throughout this talk is that M will have simple fixed points. Um, So what this means is just that the, the fixed points don't intersect the boundary of M. And um, it's quite interesting to kind of drop that assumption. And there are things you can say about that. Um, for example, if you look at, look, you can do localization for our, uh, even dimensional projective spaces, in which case you, you definitely have fixed points on the boundary. Um, but note that if you look at the, if, if our target is CP1, RP1, then as soon as we develop a real node, the real node must map to uh, RP1, and RP1 has no fixed points. So the way we define the S1 action. So this is a, a reasonable assumption. In, I mean, this, is, this holds in our case, in the cases we are interested in. Um, So here's an easy lemma. Right. OK, so 
there exist forms which I'll denote by QC in this algebra for each C going from 1, 2, et cetera, um, such that uh, the following two properties hold. First, D of QC, so D is this deformed differential that we defined, equals to 1. And we say that QC is an equivariant primitive Um, and the second um, assumption is that QC is invariant under the action of the symmetric group on C elements on the on the um, on the codimension C corners. So I should explain when I write this, I really mean just iterate the boundary operator C times on M. And you can see that there's an action of of the symmetric group just permuting the, bound, the local boundary components. We'll see an, an explicit example of this shortly. Um, so this lemma is quite easy to prove using like an invariant Riemannian metric. You can construct this QC. I'm not going to do it because we'll see um, in application that we can just write an explicit formula for it. I somehow want to state things somewhat more generally in case you have some other moduli space that you're interested in uh, applying this to. Okay, so the first theorem of, uh, I guess, says the following, if d alpha, if alpha is d closed, then the integral of alpha over m is equal to the sum over the fixed points of, I'll explain in a minute what all, all of this notation means, plus the following alternating sum of boundary, boundary and corner corrections All right, so f goes over the fixed point components of, um, of m, component of m. This is the normal bundle associated to the inclusion of f inside m. And this is the equivariant Euler. So this part is kind of, to those who know equivariant uh, uh, localization, this kind is, this is fairly familiar. And then we have these additional corrections, one for each corner, um, that involve these products of these equivariant primitives. Um, OK, I don't, I don't think I have time for a proof sketch, but let me just say that it, it's quite easy. Maybe if you just want to think about it uh, or start thinking about it, note that um, the integral over m of alpha is equal to the integral over m of d of q alpha. Suppose, alpha, suppose first m has no fixed points at all. Um, then you can choose an equivariant primitive on all of M, and, and then you get some sort of boundary term, which looks like this from Stokes' theorem. And if you kind of play around with it a little bit, some geometry and algebra, you get this uh, more general formula. OK. Um, good. So now let's, but now let's go to uh, gr open gromov written theory, which is what we're really interested in. So application to open gromov written theory. Um, so now we'll focus on the case of, uh, of genus 0. So in this case, I'm, or maps from a disk, actually. Um, so in this case, we can specify, we can kind of use a shorthand moduli specification, which just tells me what the subset of markings is and what the, the degree is, right? So this is shorthand for you know, something which has n equals 1 and g equals 
what is uh, g equals 0, h equals 1. Here we have, uh, OK, l. And just a single boundary degree. OK, this is in case you want to translate it back to the uh, <coughs> original expanded notation. This is case one and two. Yeah, I'm going to tell you also what the boundary conditions are and kind of prove the fixed point formula explicitly. Wait, in this yeah, there's just one component. Yeah, I assume it's connected. If it's what? It's a special case. Yeah, it's a special case, but it's actually easy to exponentiate this, right? When you have disjoint union of the components, nothing really interesting happens. Only the combinatorics. So originally it was disjoint union. Now I'm specializing to this case. No, 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 I see. But originally you never had like two disks that were separated. Um, only at the boundary, okay. right? No. So this is really a disjoint union okay. um, of components. Okay. So understanding the fixed points, you know, inside this moduli space is easy. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. The idea is that we have this relationship with the closed moduli space. So maybe I'll just draw an example. This is what a fixed point might look like. You know, it has um, kind of a, a single disk component and then some tree of spheres attached to it. Um, and it's easy to compute the normal bundle to it. Again, it's somehow the Z2 invariance of the normal bundle to the closed case to the corresponding double of the map. Um, so what we're really interested in is understanding, you know, we want to understand the boundary contributions. Um, what does the boundary look like? It turns out that the boundary is a, well, we know that the boundary contains various components, which are a fiber product of moduli spaces, so you can draw them like this. There's actually another type of boundary component, an exceptional boundary, but maybe I'll say a few words about it later. But a typical boundary looks like this. Um, and this maps into just a product And finally, we can just forget the extra markings. So here we get M L prime, D prime. I'm trying to get to get to some recursion here. So, right. So, this is what you should have the, the picture you should have in mind. Right. So we started from some moduli space. We looked at the boundary, and then we arrived at another pair of product of moduli spaces of the same form with no boundary markings. And let me also denote this map just by p prime times p double prime. We're going to use it in a minute to define our boundary conditions. Now, if you look at this boundary component, it's pretty natural to try to take as your equivalent primitive q um, just theta divided by minus 2u. What, what is theta? Theta is just the angular form for rp1. And this minus 2u is, is there to ensure that d of q1 indeed equals 1, as we required. Right? So it's an equivariant primitive for, um, for the boundary. Does this make sense? OK. Um, so it's a degree minus 1 form. right? This is a 1 form divided by something of degree 2. Um, and then d of it is just equal to 1. And all right, good. So here's another lemma. Let's assume that uh, both of the uh, boundaries are not zero, zero, and 
Um, okay. So if, and the following boundary condition holds, so let's assume that alpha, whatever is our integrand that we're trying to compute, restricted to this boundary component b, um, is, is a pullback of some form alpha prime and some form alpha double prime on these moduli spaces after we've forgotten the node. So let's call this the boundary condition. We'll need to extend it slightly, but this is the idea. Um, then we have this sort of version of, project of the projection formula. The integral of q1 alpha over b is equal to um, this product of um, of the difference of the degrees on each each side. So yeah, I guess I didn't say at any point, but this is my shorthand notation for a pair of degrees. Similarly for, uh, sorry. Yeah, similarly for d double prime. Okay. All right, so we have these two moduli spaces we can, and we obtain this sort of recursion that expresses the integral of this boundary term, q1 alpha, in terms of integrals of alpha prime and alpha double prime on the respective moduli spaces and some, um, some factor that comes from, you should think about it as just trying to integrate this angular form, um, theta, on the node that we're forgetting. Except it's not really, you, you know, you need to be a little bit careful because this map is not really a submersion. So, um, so Actually, proving this is a little tricky, but the idea is simple. Uh, good. So moving on to the corners. Don't worry, the talk will not be just examining all the corners, but I do want to make some point about the quadimension two corners on two corners. So let me try to draw what this moduli space looks like, at least near some quadimension two corner. So suppose we're looking at, say, degree 2, 1 disks with, say, one interior marking. So suppose this component, so what does the boundary look like? It looks like this union of two half intervals. This one maybe parameterizes, um, let me see what I've, OK. Yeah, maybe this parameterizes. Uh, these types of configurations, maybe this parenterizes, just want to be consistent. Um, yeah. This type of configurations. And then what does the uh, partial 2m looks like, look like? So this is our ms. This is boundary of ms. The boundary of the boundary is a pair of points, right? as you can see. And indeed, there's, a, there's an action of the symmetric group that swaps these two points. What do this, these corners look like? Well, both of these points correspond to configurations um, that looks like, look like this. The difference is which is the primary node and which is the secondary node. So you can think about going to to this point is you first form this node, um, so let's label it one, and then you form that node. So that's a secondary node. On the other hand, this point corresponds to forming first this node and then forming that node. Okay? And the action of, of the symmetric group just swaps these two labels. And now you see why it's useful, do I still have that formula on the board? Why it's useful to have this type of rewriting formalism, because if I use the angular form if I take q1 to be the angular form divided by minus 2u here, let's call it theta 1, and I take it to be the same theta 1 divided by minus 2u here, you see that there's some a sort of contradiction at this corner. Um, 
which is an indication that this form does not extend, is not with the restriction to the boundary of any form that's defined on the interior of the moduli space. Um, it's really only defined, and note that in the assumption of the theorem, we only assume that each one of these primitives is defined on the, on the boundary or corners for C, for co-dimension greater or equal to one. So we're still kind of in good standing with the theorem. We just need to um, introduce Q2, which in this case will be the average. So we'll take minus one over two U, again, some combinatorial factor, theta one plus theta two over two. And then, um, OK, good. Um, all right, what do I want to say next? So maybe I'll just kind of go a little bit briefly. So the idea is now you can extend the boundary condition um, in several respects. First, you extend it recursively to all corners. Um, you add a stationary assumption. This is related to um, kind of the subtleties in proving this projection formula. Um, but it basically says that alpha vanishes when, um, when you have a um, degree 0, 0 uh, boundary components, components with a factor of degree 0, 0. And, um, yeah, and also you need to deal with the exceptional boundary, which I haven't said much about. But basically, it's this boundary component that forms when a boundary shrinks. So if you look at the diagonal degrees, if your degree is um, DD, then you can have the boundary shrink to a point, And you need to say something about what happens in that case. Um, good. But anyway, um, so, so you can formulate a kind of general fixed point formula. So you know, if, you, if you extend these ba the boundary condition in this way, then you can prove, um, prove a recursion using you know, theorem one and the lemma, or ex and a, slightly extension, a slight extension of the lemma. And then you can solve it. And get a and get a fixed point formula. Now, instead of formulating it for a general alpha satisfying some boundary conditions, let me just already state it for the case that we're interested in, which is that alpha comes from these descendant integrals. So, second theorem uh, says that there exist equivariant connections. So you can just think connections with an extra term um, uh, sorry, you can just think connections um, which satisfy some invariance property on the cotangent lines. Um, Satisfying some uh, recursive condition, satis or let me just write some boundary condition. Such that if we set such that setting, if we set um, psi j to be the first churn class of Lj. So this is now a first churn form, sorry, defined uh, using this connection. And we take uh, rho plus minus 1 to be Poincare dual to p plus minus 1. Now everything is reasonably well defined. I mean, maybe I've omitted a few words in between, but everything now can be well defined precisely. Um, so this is equivariant Poincare dual. Uh, supported near the, the, the fixed points, p plus or minus, then 
uh, let me kind of write it briefly, but the open Gromov written invariants of S are uh, well defined independent of all choices. And let me now, I have only five minutes left, let me just tell you what the fixed point formula for. So the, the last result I want to tell you about is that you can actually compute it. All right, well, maybe I can use another board, but it doesn't matter. So OK, so suppose we fix some s as, if, as before, so some finite subset and a degree. An LD labeled tree, t, is just a tree with some, sub, some set of vertices and edges um, with some function that goes from the vertices to um, the set of finite subsets, um, in fact, OK, I mean, really what you should think of is you should think of this function as specifying the markings on each vertex and the degree of each vertex. And um, good. Oh, this, uh, well, these, this function should satisfy kind of the obvious requirement that L is equal to the disjoint union over LV over all the vertices, and D should equal to the sum of DV over all the vertices. OK, good. So that's, that's the type of diagrams we'll consider when we compute the fixed point formula. And for each diagram, we have a contribution. So let me kind of write what that is. Um, so theorem, the open gram of Witten of LD is equal to the sum over all the isomorphism types of such diagrams. OK, let me write the formula and then explain. 1 over the automorphism group, the size of the automorphism group of the diagram. So I hope you can. So here I've just written the integrand, so the product over all the psi classes and the pullback of the forms restricted to the fixed point f. Um, okay, the formula is almost done. I just need to write more, one more term, and then I'll explain what we have here. Um, So there's also a contribution from the closed moduli spaces in case we look at, um, in case the degree, this is ki kind of comes from the exceptional boundary that I mentioned, in case the degree um, is a diagonal degree. So d is uh, equal to d plus and d minus. And if not, there's no, no, no such correction um, sorry. otherwise. OK, good. So what do we have here? Um, so we go over all the um, LD labeled trees up to isomorphism. We divide by the size of the automorphism group of the tree, which is just a group of isomorphisms, self-isomorphisms, which preserve the labelings. Then we have this, com this uh, uh, factor, which is kind of reminiscent of what we have in the lemma. Um, maybe I should, this entire factor kind of comes from the projection formula. And for each, um, for each vertex in the, in the, in the diagram, we have the usual contribution of fixed points. 
Um, we go over the fixed points inside the, the corresponding moduli space, and then we get this uh, contribution of the integrand divided by the Euler of the normal bundle. Um, and then again, there's this exceptional boundary correction. So, okay, I'm really out of time, but let me just kind of draw what you, how you should think about this. So if you expand the sum, you really get this sum of fixed points, but you also allow the, the fixed points to be connected by edges, right? In a kind of these edges correspond to real nodes or used to correspond to real nodes, and then we kind of smoothed and forgot, forgotten about them. And each such edge carries carries uh, one of these uh, these factors. Okay, I don't want to write it. Um, okay, I think, I mean, I was planning to say a few more words, but I think this is maybe a good time to stop. Um, thank you.